Three years ago, we hosted a Turkish J-1 visa student when he first arrived in Kodiak. His name is Sirke, and he stayed with us for two weeks before his work in the canneries began. But when he went to the canneries, he did not have work or a place to stay. Sirke stayed with another woman in town, doing jobs around her house while he waited for a job in the canneries. He finally got a job in late July and August. The J-1 visa controversy has many different aspects and perspectives. I am trying to get as many of the different points of view as I can. I have interviewed Filipinos that have worked in the canneries. My name is Mary Gillis Howard. A J-1 visa student. And my name is Saka. A cannery manager. My name is Matthew Moyer. And Alaska Senator Mark Beggage. The J-1 visa program started in 1942. So the J-1 visa was designed as an educational opportunity and a work program, a work study program basically. Uh, but over the years, uh, it's become a prominent component of our fishing industry as a way to bring workers in in need because we don't have enough to fill the job. Now the J-1 visa program brings 5,000 college students to Alaska every summer. According to Mary Gillis Hover, 350 of them come to Kodiak. But Kodiak, we don't need that much. We don't need 350. Some of the Filipinos in Kodiak feel that the J-1 visa students are taking their jobs in the canneries. But some people have different opinions. Last year there wasn't very many fish in the canneries. Uh, there were very many salmon harvested. So there was, there was actually a little shortage of work. And so some of the um, local workers felt that the J-1 visas took work opportunity away from them. In reality, if there's no work, nobody's taken it from one, one sector to the other. It just was, it wasn't the fall of the J-1 visas, it just wasn't very many fish. Whatever the cause is, the lack of jobs is still serious. Without their cannery jobs, Filipinos don't make enough money. People also get sick and don't go to the doctor because they don't have money to pay. Most of them, they're very, very ill. A lot of them that I worked with before, they're, you know, they have cancer and they will not even go seek help because they cannot afford an emergency room. And it's too late by the time they get there. Most of them have died. I mean, it is true and it is very sad. And they are unable to pay their rent. They're unable to pay their utilities. It's either do I pay my utility or do I eat? The Filipinos are not the only ones having trouble. The J-1 visa students also have difficulties. Like depression. Because they, they only change it for a time and after one or two months, they uh, feel like they, they, will not, they will not be able to go back to Turkey. They feel like that. So they, some of my friends had some depression. Although the Filipinos feel that the J-1 visa students are taking away their jobs, Sir Kent and Matt Moyer believe that their overall rela working relationships are good. Uh, some of the Filipinos, uh, for example, they are working for 10 years. They, they have been working for the Canada for 10 years, 11 years, 12 years, and you come and you, are, you, you start to do the same job with them. You know, you are a new worker, if you work for two or three days, you are doing the same job with them. They might be a bit jealous for them. That's some, they, these are some problems. But usually the, 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 the relationships are good. Uh, my perspective on that is that it's um, been very good. But there are solutions to the controversy, as Mary and Begich express. The solution is to regulate it. High regulated. Or in our case, we think the J-1 visa is especially one on education, and we are going to recommend a different type of visa. We call it the H-2O visa, specifically designed to fill that gap when no one in the community or not enough workers are in the community to fill those jobs. Then still leaving the J-1 visa available for those educational opportunities.